Hello, everyone. I'm really, really pleased that Stu J is here with me today because um, we've sort of known of each other for ages and ages. And we got to meet up a few years ago in Thailand. And then again, you came to speak at the Polyglot Conference in Fukuoka, Japan in 2019. And it's been since then, really, that we haven't been able to talk because of um, the big C word, COVID. <laughs> so how are you? How are things yeah. going? I can't believe it. Like, well, well, given the circumstances, but it just, it seems like that, that we're in Fukuoka, because basically after that, COVID happens. And here we are. I know it's absolutely crazy. And I think also you've just been through so much this last year as well. I mean, you know, you've got your your your, your newborn that's now turned one. Um, you also had all the issues, didn't yes. you? Health issues with your throat. And I'm very, very happy to see that that you're speaking normally and it's all back to normal again for you. Yeah, I've got six titanium bolts stuck in here. And um, when they did the, um, the ACDF, fusion here it killed the vo the left vocal nerve so basically i lost my voice for about three months and it's just i've got it back this past month maybe five weeks now which is great because as a linguist um and yeah. my voice is the base of everything i do not having a voice sucks yeah i mean absolutely i think probably i'm not going to be the only uh person in the language community that really felt that for you just thinking, I hope everything's going to be okay. Because um, I think that's most people's nightmare, isn't it? Uh, is, is the thought of losing your voice, right? You, when, you, you, when you're into languages. You know, um, a, a funny story, the way the internet works. So you probably saw that clip that I put out on YouTube when I'd lost my voice and, and I, I, I spoke. Um, somebody on LinkedIn, total stranger, said, have you ever heard of this therapy and water therapy and some vocal coaches use it and they use it to um, uh, help bring the voice back and so basically what you do is you get a tube like a big fat straw mm -hmm. and you put it in a bowl of water and in doing the water it takes that fresh the air pressure off the vocal folds and so what I would do and so I tried it I, I researched up on it and I could actually start to get to the point in my voice where the voice would actually start vibrating and then slowly basically like therapy sing scales until i could start getting it back so once i started that i guess within about 10 days i started to get my voice back that's amazing which was fantastic oh well, good on that person for writing uh, for you because um yeah so you basically get a i i yeah I, I got, you know, the bubble tea straws because we have them in 7-Eleven here. People don't use straws, but they still have them here. Um, so I got these bubble tea straws and put it in a, a bowl of water and then would just do these exercises trying to sing scales, mm -hmm. blowing bubbles into the bowl of water until I got my voice back. So thank you, whoever that was on LinkedIn. It was actually amazing. Wow. No, I'm really, well, I'm very pleased because it also means I get to talk to you now and we get to make a video together, <laughs> which is even better. So we can share some of the fantastic yes. things we've been writing about. Now, for those of you who probably might not know some of these things, so Studio and I have been friends on Facebook for a few years as well. And I see some of the things you put out there and I've re I react to them. And I just, I've seen some just genius things. And I'm not gonna talk about the jokes that you put out there because they're obviously very funny too, but also, <laughs> <laughs> but that's a completely different topic. And we'll stay up with the comedy for now. It's pretty late in the night here, we can do that. Yeah. <laughs> but there are definitely two strands I think we should hit on. And, and one of them is about education and particularly now with what happened with COVID, the whole of 2020. And you've had some yeah. very sort of outspoken ideas that are not your normal or considered sort of sort of box, the box that we normally think about education is you have your maths, you have your history, you have your subjects. And okay, you have schools like in Finland where you have work on projects, but you've got some quite radical mm. ideas, I guess is the best word for this, for some people who will be sitting there listening and thinking, oh, what's he going to say about education? But just talk a little bit about your ex your experience with this 12-year-old boy that you had, uh, that you were teaching, and the parents asked you to tutor at the, him. At right. the time, he was, at the time he was 11. So um, uh, 
uh, it's, I guess it's almost three years ago now. Um, and so his mum, and I've never done this with anyone before because I realized a while back the way that you and I say learn languages is probably different to your average person who wants to, who says they want to learn a language. Mm -hmm. And so as a rule, I didn't teach this kind of stuff. But his mum said to me, look, can you please just teach my son? Whatever you can do, just teach him. Um, or at least see if you'd like to teach him. And I thought, oh, okay. Um, and so I play jazz piano. I, I love mu anything musical. Um, and so he wanted to get into piano. And so his mum said, how about this? To show that he's serious, just come and sit with him for a bit and see how far you can push him. And so I did, and I showed him a few things. And I've actually got some, just like we learn languages, I've done some things to try and um, embed jazz harmony and diff different um, voicings of chords and things into muscle memory. And so I tried a few things with him and then, you know, went over a bit of theory about how scales work and blah, blah, blah. Um, you know, tone, tone, semitone, tone, 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 semitone, and then got him generating scales himself. And in the space of about 90 minutes, I thought, holy crap, okay. And so his parents went out and that week bought a grand piano for him, a really oh, wow. nice one. <laughs> um, Lucky boy. And he was committed. Yeah, he actually felt really bad. He said, mom, I, I feel really bad. Many people want a piano. You know, why is it that I have to, you know, it's not fair that I get to get one. But he, he's a good kid. Anyway, we did that. And then we did, can I share my screen? Yeah, of course. Okay. So I've just built a JSON object. His name was Sean. So we looked at language, IT, math and logic, music, and personal development. Mm -hmm. And so say in IT, um, what we did was um, we looked at network security, Linux terminal, coding, Vim, uh, the most one of the most powerful um, word processors on the planet. Um, for those who aren't into Emacs, um, I love Vim. Uh, open source intelligence gathering, using things like Multigo and, and things in different like Kali Linux, Parrot OS, 3D graphics. Um, so that was the IT section. Language, we did Chinese, English, Norwegian, Spanish, and then say you get into Chinese, Chinese phonetics, developing native prosody, training the muscles to write like a native, training uh, traditional versus simplified characters. So what I would do, because he was learning Chinese at school, but it wasn't going very far and just learning the normal um, uh, the, the, the simplified characters. And he was learning the Kaishu, um, just the very block way of doing it. So to have a bit of fun, we just installed a brush app on his iPad. And then we'd get into, you know, the different strokes in calligraphy and trying to get, you know, if you look at a hung, a straight across stroke in Chinese, yeah. it's actually almost like a figure eight, the way your muscles work. And so we get his muscles working like a native Chinese speaker would have their muscles start to do it. But we hope at, at a bit of an accelerated speed to what Chinese kids would have done over years of learning. So then we'd have fun, a fun I'd say, okay, write this character like an old person, right? It's like a young person. Um, so stuff that you normally wouldn't get even in a school. Um, we did that with language just cause he thought it was fun. Um, mimicking sound shifts. So, you know, Taiwanese accent versus Beijing accent, um, general conversations, humor in the language, looking at jokes, um, Norwegian, he's living in Norway now. He's actually half Norwegian, half Thai. And so, you know, we did space repetition for next. We did all of these things. Um, if you look at music, you know, jazz theory, performance, piano, ear training, music programming. And then this actually went back into the language because we were training and doing ear training. Long story short, in 18 months, um, I'll expand everything. This is what we covered. Wow. Um, <laughs> math and logic, you know, um, doing the abacus cryptography and we and then that mixed in with the computer because he was eight we did manual cryptography and showing him how to build ciphers and different kinds of ciphers playfair ciphers and we actually did i developed a playfair cipher based on the indic abugida so the so rather than doing a b c d 
we used the five by five grid, and then we could do that in Thai. Um, jazz theory, all these um, critical thinking, so personal development. We did taught him how to hypnotize and do self-hypnosis, um, developing self-confidence, identifying people's needs. So we did debating skills, doing presentation skills, all my old Dale Carnegie stuff um, when I was a Dale Carnegie trainer. Um, memory techniques, so major system, um, mnemonics, thinking loud, situational awareness. Um, so basically, he got all of this training in 18 months. Um, wow. He drove the syllabus. I think that was the key. I didn't drive the syllabus. He told me what he wanted to learn. And it was up to me to find a way to get enough then so he would have enough knowledge to find more. And so he actually learned how to learn. That's really important for kids. Having a team. Yeah, so any yeah, yeah, it's really important. So, so th that, that, was, that, that went for 18 months. I got excited to see that the way that my grandfather taught me was able to be cookie cut kind of in this way. Yeah. And then the next thing was, can this be cookie cut to a larger scale? So um, I think we mentioned, luckily, um, there's one school here, Verso International School, mm -hmm. and we're going to be running a pilot program just on the language section initially yeah. and see if we can do this with other kids. I think that's really, really positive. I mean, this is the thing, you know, um, sometimes traditional education, it can get a bit stale and also it can feel a bit divorced from what you do in the real world, right? And, um, when, when you sort of tailor it and especially when you make it something where you're teaching those skills to go out and learn and to consider things, I think they're the kinds of skills that we really need to make sure our, our kids have, right? Um, critical thinking. I'm, I'm really cr critical thinking, especially now. Yeah, <laughs> the ability to, <laughs> the ability to hold and even debate two, mm -hmm. three, four sides of an argument yeah. without putting those walls up. I, th I think it almost doesn't exist in some places now. Um, my daughter, like I said, she was born one year and one week ago today. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm in a tough position because one, international schools in Thailand are some of the most expensive on the planet. Yeah. And it just kills me to think what, okay, you put that money up, that's one thing, but what is she going to get in return? Mm. Um, and I think we're at a very interesting point as far as education, the development of education in the planet, especially yeah. since COVID has changed that paradigm. Um, we actually, we don't know what to do. I would love to teach her, but I also need to work. Yeah, it, I think we are at an interesting stage and I, I don't know how it's going to move forward because this year, I mean, what I've noticed with a lot of institutions, they've had to sort of step up the game really with how they teach and their ability to, to use technology to make things work. And one thing I've noticed is that you can do a lot more stuff now online than you could do before. So this mm. past year, I managed to do a course in North Sami, which I never would have got to study with wow. through a course. Uh, that was the first one. I did a course in Scots. Um, I've done, I've been doing courses in uh, Cornish, uh, in Scottish Gaelic, um, wow. and, and then following other languages, obviously, that I, I speak or have studied before. But those languages, when on earth would I ever, in the Balkans, when would you ever get to experience a, a class or see material? I mean, North Sami, there aren't really many materials or any tutors that you can find right. so easily. So, so doing these things and kind of diving into different uh, languages and not just languages. My daughter's been doing piano lessons online for the last year, and and that's been working right. really well, surprisingly really well. Um, so, I mean, there are a lot more opportunities with technology than I thought there ever could be. I mean, obviously, we did the so conference online and. People, people were holding sessions using languages on that as well. Um, and it worked, I think, pretty well. well and, and so look at what, what you just said there too. Traditionally, you would be limited to whatever the teaching capacity was at an institution. Yeah. So if you had a teacher that taught 
Sami or, or whatever, whatever it was there, you're lucky you can learn and but you then you would be learning with them as your mentor or them as your tutor and then there would be a certain limitation now people and especially since covid some schools they had to scramble they didn't have content so they're going leasing content or just telling getting from anywhere my daughter in australia part of her high school they can actually do the first year of a business degree which is great they were learning with the teachers going to school then as soon as covid hit they went and leased all of this stuff from institutions in the US so they could do their business subjects online because they didn't have the online courses. Her grades went from there now is like getting straight A's wow. from, from not a very good student at all. She's studying, she's getting into the work. And then the question is, yeah. okay, so why do we have schools? If you can now learn, and the paradigm that you're learning under is this online thing from the best people on the planet, just as easily as you're going to learn from the crappy teacher at your school who puts some crappy online lessons together, why on earth would you be learning from the school? Why don't you learn from the best? Um, I mean, I, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sort of balance that out with, I think the social aspect of going to school and being all, all those social situations is still really, really important. So for us as a family, we, we sort of, we wait for, well, we're waiting for that time for her to be able to go back to school just to have that social interaction. Uh, for us, that's really quite, quite important. But like you say, with, with studies, as far as studies are, are concerned, actually my daughter now really likes studying from home and she sees the benefits of just, not being in a classroom where other children can distract her in the same way. She, she knows her assignments. She can, you know, listen to the lessons. And the school's done a pretty good job, I think. I mean, we've been quite lucky in that respect. I, I know there have been some nightmare stories. Right. Um, but all, also, she can combine it with other classes and other things. Like you say, you know, you get the best of, of many worlds. And, and it's, it has opened up opportunities. Um, and... So this, this Verso International School, um, they have actually leased, have you seen those masterclasses that they're advertising? Yes, yes, yes. And so that's actually become part of their syllabus now for the students that go out. Incredible. Um, and they don't need to make the content. It's, I, I think it's fantastic. This is the way schools are going to go. I mean, there's no need to reinvent the wheel, right? You, I mean, we've had, we've had your future learns and things like that going for a while. And, you know, the... Um, sort of those online courses and I've, I've done a number of those on, on future learning Udemy and, and different pl platforms and, and they worked really really well I mean I did a Frisian one once mm. I did I've, I've I was I'm looking at the Irish one that they have on on future learn and I find them fascinating that you can just access all of this stuff now that you couldn't get years ago it's impossible I mean you know you just and you I think learn standard things let alone things that were a little bit more niche so, so coming down to it, it's these skills in learning how to learn because the information's there. There's, there's information on almost anything, especially like if you look at um, my wife is doing a, um, a degree course through uh, PolyU, uh, the school of uh, PolyU in Hong Kong. Um, their courses, however, they have, they're using the MOOCs courses. So from Cornell and from, from whatever other institutions that they have there, and you can learn all of that for free. You only pay money if you actually want the degree that goes with it. So yeah. the actual learning is there for free. Some of the most, you know, from some of the most amazing institutions on the planet. Um, so learning now, the ability to learn is going to be the core skill. Yeah, I, no, I agree. I think there's an awful lot now online. Like you said, the MOOCs have, have really changed things quite a lot and uh, made a lot more possible. And talking about sort of yeah. online, because this is the sign of to sort of transition into the second thing that I've, I've noticed with you, you put this information out there. Now, I, I've started learning Korean this year with my daughter. My daughter wanted to learn Korean. So we started this whole thing of learning Korean. And one of the things that I noticed was I needed a way to bring Korean to me and to bring Korea to me, because first of all, I can't travel anywhere. So I can't go to Korea. And secondly, I could probably right. count the number of Koreans that have ever been to the Balkans on, on one finger, let alone one hand. <laughs> I mean, we just don't have Koreans. It's just, I think I've met mm. one Korean here, seriously. It's like, 
we just don't come across the um, the culture or the language at all. And right. so one thing that I've noticed that I can do is make my social media fit and to, to, to sort of attract that kind of content to my feed. So by following people on, particularly on Instagram, I find really good for this. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, I really do. Because like now I just open up my Instagram, I check it, and I'm confronted with Korean all the time. So I don't even need to try. It's just there. Fantastic. And and that works. From, that works so, so well for me. And the same on TikTok. I follow language uh, channels on TikTok and I'm confronted constantly with language stuff. Even English. I actually quite like some of the people that teach English because they, they talk about the history and the, the of, of idioms and expressions and words and grammar, right. why we say things a certain way. And like you, I think, there's no end to what I can learn, right? And even though English is, you know, a first language for me, I still can't constantly learn something new in English, let alone the other languages that I've studied or any other topics. And I love that we can right. do that. What I, what I enjoy about your feed on, on Facebook is you give me some of that knowledge as well. So, I mean, I'd love for you to just share and talk through some of these info <laughs> doing one of them really stuck out to me <laughs> and I'll, I'll let people decide Actually, that might be the first one was as it comes up but one of them stuck out to me because as a westerner from a western perspective with western history mm -hmm. taught to me as it was you'll see as we go through if you're from a western country you'll see what i mean very very shortly but um i loved the history behind it because once well, you get over the shot you you start learning and that's the key thing right is learning so i would say uh can you see my screen now yes yes okay so <laughs> I, that's probably the slide you're talking about um and i put this up the other day i run cross-cultural courses for um people coming into thailand businesses setting up here and there's, there are a lot of cultural shocks um, for people. Uh, one of them that people don't know, and you would, uh, for some reason, my um, it says it's loading. What's going on there? Um, one of the, I'll just, I'll just pull it. I'll just do it on the uh, normal screen. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't want, to, I don't want to have dead air here. Here we go. Okay, we'll, we'll just let it come here. I'll do All some right, so very too much. Can you see my screen now? Yes, I can see your screen now. Okay. So you would know when Thais um, say hello, they'll put their hands together and they'll why. We call it why when you bow with your hands. And then they will say sawaddi. If you're a, a guy, you say sawaddi krab. And if you're a lady, sawaddi ka. Um, a lot of people don't actually now. No, as you start to be able to read Thai, People think, why does it have this weird spelling? It's actually um, S, if you were to do it, S W A S D I. And people think swasti. Well, actually, when you do that, what, this comes from the words su, meaning goodness, asti, it is in Sanskrit, which is esta. Mm -hmm. Okay, so su, good, esta, esta bueno. Um, it is good. And so suasti, when santi uh, kicks in, it becomes suasti, suasti, svasti. Um, so svasti, and you would know from your Indo-European um, Slavic languages, a diminutive particle that you have is ka. So vod, uh, water, vodka, um, is little water. And the same here, so svasti means um, a little piece of goodness, um, prosperity, it's used as a blessing. And then the symbol that represents that, the little thing that is, is the svastika. And so you, if you walk into temples, if you walk anywhere, you'll see on people's doors going into their houses, this is symbol goes back thousands of years. Um, and it's there's not the bad reaction that people get because of what Hitler did with the symbol. Now, I might, I'll say, and I mentioned in this post that a lot of people say, oh yeah, but uh, Hitler turned it around. 
that's not true. Actually, both of them are good in, um, if you have a look at um, mm. Hinduism, the one that goes the other way is called the um, Saustika or Savstika. And that's actually uh, based on, I think, um, the Kali, some, some, uh, the goddess Kali, and uh, who is actually the goddess of death, but it's also a blessing. It's um, when you see both of those, they just have slightly different meanings. But this swastika is, is a little piece of goodness, prosperity offered to you. So when you put your hands together and why and say, Sawadi, you're actually becoming a swastika personified to the person that you're offering. So you're offering yourself as a little piece of goodness, happiness, love, um, you become a human swastika. Now, I understand that you had a funny gut reaction when you saw this. Yeah, I, I, so my, my initial reaction was, what on earth has he posted on Facebook? Because, uh, yeah, I mean, it's just, it, there's an automatic reaction. As a somebody who's grown up in, in Europe, um, particularly for as a Brit, um, right. The, when we see the sign, it's just, uh, unfortunately, it turned into a sign of hate for, for what we, you know, for sort of what I think a lot of people um, who, who have had that kind of education in the West and the history tied to it and everything else. It's very difficult to divorce that from. Yeah, and I think it's going to be a while. We've got into some great discussions in a Thai group with this and men, I would say the 90% of them actually um, embrace it. And so, so they, they, they've, they've shifted their mind, but some people came and said, look, no matter what you say or whatever, that symbol will never ever be able to be thought of as good and it should be you know, erased off the planet. And they have their reasons for it and, and that's understood. But you just, when you live in this part of the world, having that attitude is going to guarantee that you're miserable because you see this everywhere, along with a zillion other cultural things well, that are going to shock you. Well, exactly. I mean, I remember actually seeing it in Bali. I was with my, my wife and daughter in Bali and, um, and we went into a jewelry shop. My wife and daughter were looking for some, some jewelry. Uh, just, I think it was like a bracelet or a necklace. And we, I saw swastika earrings. And right. my, my immediate reaction and my daughter's immediate reaction, because she'd done some World War II history at that point, was, oh, what's the swastika doing there? And I, said, and, I, and I had to tell her, you know, it's, it's Bali, it's got a Hindu tradition, and these symbols are from that part of the world where this meant yeah. me something very different. And, and again, in Balinese, the greeting is exactly the same. Sawatdi in Thai. Om Svasti Astu. So you actually have the Astu and Svasti is kept in there. Om is like Om, yeah. um, the unified sound. So Om Svasti Astu, again, you're becoming a swastika. In Khmer is the same, um, and, and which is the word Svasti. So all of these countries basically have used that as a greeting. Now, I just might uh, mention, Thai, in Thai, it never used to be said until 1943. Um, and uh, a linguist monk, Nim Gantanatiwa, worked with um, black people in Songkram at the time, who is, I have to be careful how I describe this. But anyway, uh, to sound more European and exotic, because you have good morning, good evening, good afternoon, a whole new set of greetings, instead of just saying sabaydi, mm -hmm. um, or have you eaten yet, gin yang, um, they brought in Sawadi Krap, and then um, in the morning would be Arun Sawat. In the evening, Sayan Sawat, and then in the eve and at night time, um, Ratri Sawat. Mm -hmm. Thais never used those; they just felt too weird. But they wanted to have parallels because the high languages in Europe have greetings for each time of the day. But everyone stuck to Sawadi, which stays true until today. Yeah, I mean, I remember my my, my grandparents in Thailand. Uh, they they would never say good night, <laughs> like well, before they could, they just right. you just disappear off the bed, and they. Yeah. <laughs> and my my dad was like, "What? Where have they gone?" <laughs> and I said, "Well, they've gone to bed, probably." And I went, well, don't they say good night? No, 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 there's no good night. They just yeah. disappear. 
<laughs> and it, yeah, it's, and it's the same with things like thank you. I think there was a discussion. You know, Thai is actually you say thank you and the these kind. There's no real word for please either. It's the way that you say it. Yeah. Um, uh, there's no word for yes. Again, mm -hmm. uh, that was one of the. Um, I think where is that here? That's one of my lessons because a lot of people come here. Uh, th this is an interesting thing. Don't just think of Thai, but this is a, a lesson across the board. Yeah people will say, how do you say yes in Thai when they will come to the country? Yeah. Now, there's actually no word for yes. The word, and but people think, oh, okay, what's that? Is it yes, Thai? But Thai literally means it is. Yeah. And of course, the general rule in Thai, like many other um, languages in Chinese and Vietnamese, to say yes, you basically repeat the verb. Yeah. Um, and for a negative, you put the negative particle, then the verb. So if I wanted, if I wanted to say, this is your pen, mm. is it? And you would say, it is. Chai mai, chai. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. chai is the actual verb there to, to be. Is it? It is. Chai. But if I wanted, if I said to you, um, rap cha mai, would you like some tea? Lap means to, to receive into yourself. So you say when you want something, lap cha mai, lap kap, you would say lap receive. There's no word for yes. Um, however, lap cha mai, would you like to lap the cha? Many foreigners would say chai, would you, which basically means would you um, like to receive the tea? Would you like some tea? It is. It just doesn't make sense. I like that you do the Indian accent when you do that. <laughs> and you did the, the shape of your as well. <laughs> oh, it is. I'm allowed, to, I'm allowed to do this because I am being half Indian. Um, <laughs> but that's, that's what it feels like. If you, you know, would you like tea? It is. <laughs> oh, do you know what? It's um, my favorite that, accent in the world, an Indian accent in English. I love that. I, I, I was a flight attendant about 25 years ago, and um, I, one of these, um, there was one flight where there was an Indian, old Indian couple, and they were waiting. Um, I finally got to them, and he looked up to me, I am a chicken, <laughs> she is a cow. <laughs> so, for, the, for the beef, for the, for the meals, I am a chicken, she is a cow. <laughs> That's so cute, though. I love don't, don't, don't call your wife that. <laughs> um, but anyway, okay. Well, he, he wasn't I'm, I'm going to get done. He was calling his wife a cow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, dear. Yeah. So anyway, uh, that's enough cultural appropriation for, for tonight. But these, these are some of the things. Actually, this, this is a fascinating concept. Here you go. Mm. Um, and again, it's politically incorrect in the West, maybe. Um, I use this when I, but it's not just Thai, it's many languages across. So in English, we say big, bigger, biggerest, biggest, biggerest, if you're a president of some countries. Um, uh, tall, taller, tallest. Um, but in Thai, you don't have that mechanism. So, Back 20 years ago, when I first came up with this, let me let me say say these words to you, and I just want you to, I'll call them yin and yang. So yin is is the, is, is black negative. Now and now, don't get political. You can't get political when you're learning a language. Sometimes you need to put it aside. Okay, so um, yin is the negative, yang positive. I'm going to say some words, and just within a split second. I want you to say whether they're yin or yang, okay? Um, increase. Yin. Increase, so yin is negative. Oh, sorry, yang. <laughs> oh, sorry, yeah, okay. Ugly. Ugly is negative. Okay. Yin. Um, exacerbate. Negative. Pandemic. Definitely negative. <laughs> Although there are some positives, as we've discussed. Yeah, yeah. Beautiful. Uh, positive. White. Oof. <laughs> Depends if you put if you put power ah. at the end of it. Negative, I guess. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yes. Inflation. 
inflation positive? Um, discipline. Positive. Right. And that's an interesting one because for some people it's positive in that it brings harmony and unity. Across Asia, it's almost universally positive. For some people, however, discipline is something that limits you. And so it might be negative. Now, why do we do this? We have these words, kun mm -hmm. and long. Now, now, you might get taught initially that kun means to go up, long means to go down. But what kun actually means is something that's white or positive getting whiter and whiter. And long is something that's black getting blacker and blacker. So, for example, soy means beautiful. Mm -hmm. You, there's no thing that you can say beautiful or uh, <laughs> in yeah, yeah. Thai. You have to say soy kun, mm -hmm. which is beautiful kun, because it's already white and it's getting whiter. You could not say soy long. Mm -hmm. It's a syntax error. But you, the word for terrible, for example, yeah, you couldn't say yeah, couldn't you say yeah long? Because the situation, yeah, is already dark and it's getting darker and darker. And so culturally, you have to get in the mind of whether this is positive or negative for the native speakers of that language, not for you. Mm -hmm. And again, it's and that, that, that's politically challenging for some people. So anyway, the, these infographics are there. Um, one last one maybe is this one. Uh, when a lot of people learn Thai. Yeah, I love this. I remember this when you put it out. And I, uh, you know, I remember with my, my stepmom as a kid, she brought out these books to try and teach me some um, of the, the Thai alphabet. I, I wanted to learn it, but it was just completely all over the place for me because it was just random. And, and it was all- With random words? Yeah, it was just really random, like Ngong um, goes with a, which is a snake and, Right. Why? I, I, I never got it. And I just saw how pretty your, your one looked on the right and thought, why did I not go to, why was I not taught Thai that way? Um, exactly. Um, and this is, this is, I've been trying to sort of preach this for, for many years, but basically the Thai alphabet is based on the Indic system, which is a map of the human mouth. So you've got the back, the palate, is cerebral so basically the roof of the mouth for the indians but the thais could not say it like this what are you talking about we don't know what you say you say the different letter <laughs> different sound we cannot say the sound so the the ones that are coming from the roof of the mouth is the just turned to a normal the and then the lips but so you've got ka, ka, ta, ta, pa. so moving from the back to the front and then if this was the indian one ka, 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 nga. It's a beautiful matrix. And so the Thai alphabet's based on this. Um, it's a map of the human mouth. But when they teach it, unlike in Cambodia or any other country that actually teaches to this matrix, they just basically string them all out and have people learn them in this sort of in series rather than in the, the matrix. And it's insane because not only they learn them in series, but then they're told, oh, you have to remember this letter, this letter, this letter, this letter, this letter is in this class. And so it's almost like mind, uh, mind sweeper trying to just basically figure out which letters are from this group, where in actual fact, you learn it in this, you don't even need to learn the alphabetical order. You just need to know the system mm -hmm. and everything fits in place. Interesting thing, have a look at this. Ga, ja, da, um, ba, is the reverse it's the same map that you learn if have you ever you've learned mandarin right yes mm -hmm. okay uh -huh. it's in reverse it's yeah. the exact same system cool. um and the tones the tone classes you know whether it's stopped throat voiced not voiced aspirated they're actually so this is stopped throat this column here aspirated voiced normal voice and so they're the same categories that you get the yin and yang tones in from middle chinese mm -hmm. all the way through cantonese still keeps those same tone classes in mandarin they've merged um but but all the um ping shang xu ru sheng the different tones in chinese are based on this same map of the human mouth as well mm -hmm. so 
this is the Rosetta Stone for mouths. <laughs> for, yeah. for phonetics. Yeah, Rosetta Stone. We mean the original Rosetta Stone, don't we? <laughs> yes. Yes. Not. Not the three ninety nine a uh, a package of. Uh, I, I won't go there. Anyway. Yes. Yes. Anyway, I, I, I guess that's enough. But this is. I've I've been doing these ones just just lately, um, especially since COVID and uh, the past few months, putting these up just to put, try to see if I could visualize and put these bite-sized lessons. Oh, this is another word, sound paradigms. Don't get your people from Western speaking languages who bring their rhythms of that language over tonal languages, totally destroy tonal languages. So giving, so for example, people say, hi, how are you? And then rather than sawati kap, they'll say sawati kap. And it, it buggers up their tones so i'm trying to visualize these things in a very small instagrammable um visual bite and hopefully they can help people so i mean because you've got the book as well right um cracking yeah. five fundamentals is that is that right and indeed i do uh, um if you go to jacademy.com well here. in in these yeah and I've actually, there's an interactive one. There's the book, the books. It's also good for killing cockroaches. It's quite big. <laughs> um, but it, basically, CT, that was a mind. I was asked back in 2000, 1999, 2000, could I put a program together for a bunch of journalists? Let me um, stop sharing here. So um, could I put a program together for a bunch of journalists mm -hmm. and uh, UN workers and um embassy staff who were members of the Foreign Correspondents Club of Thailand to hit the ground running with Thai because they many of them had started learning, they'd ask questions and they'd get every answer like, it's just like that. Yeah. And never understand why and they'd give up and then they never end up speaking Thai. And so I tried to put something together so they could actually have those things answered. And Cracking Thai Fundamentals I wrote after running the book after running the program for face to face for 17 years, it was a brain dump. Yeah. And then there's also the online bit of it. But yeah, I, I want to put some more stuff out. But this is, I guess, it's starting to morph into something that's more social media now. Yeah, I mean, I absolutely would love to get a copy as well. So I'd be, um, I'll, I'll have a look and see if I can. Now, the post is a bit tricky in the Balkans. Uh, things tend right. to arrive or arrive like months and months later um but as, as soon as getting back to the uk is possible then i will i will order my copy to coffee copy yeah copy to arrive there. do you have amazon uh no we don't have amazon no okay <laughs> yeah because we don't have it like amazon yeah but it's a pain in the ass to get it here so i i deliver locally in thailand but otherwise amazon amazon does it but i will no. definitely get my copy because i i think i've been through that pain barrier several times uh, particularly with Thai the family have tried to sort of get me to read and write it and I've, I've been through the process a few times but it never really gels with me um, mm. and I always feel you know sort of having that link to the country I always feel that I would like to um, improve the, my sort of childhood kitchen Thai as I call it uh, but yeah. no it's fantastic that you had the exposure then because all the sounds are uh, already there then um, yeah, i'm not going to embarrass myself and sort of show how bad <laughs> how bad it is do, but do you speak do you speak cantonese uh no i don't speak cantonese um i've not really studied the only thing i know is like basic greetings in cantonese uh but okay. i've not really even studied it um because uh, there's a lot of similarities to can like compared to mandarin cantonese like tone wise the numbers do um so yeah, I'm yeah, similar. and I know, for example, just just looking at the Sino-Korean numbers recently, um, yeah, number ten for them is ship, ship, yeah, which it's like okay, well that's different to Chinese in, in terms of how how Ch Mandarin Chinese is, but it's related, but it's still it felt more similar to Thai, right? Well, because then in Cantonese, um, sap. So sub, sip, ship, shi. Sh. But what you notice, sh in Mandarin, you, because your throat's closed, a yeah. lot of these uh sounds came from the the 
entering tone, which is um, when it's cut off either by a ba, da, ga, so ship, that, or in Japanese where you have like deki. Um, these ones also come from those those entering tones in uh, Middle Chinese, which you still have in Cantonese. Yeah, there are so, some, there's some really cool links between these languages. I mean, we've had we've had a few talks at the Polyglot Conference about these sort of the crossovers as well. And I think there are probably many, many, many more talks. And maybe you might want to do one at the next Polyglot Conference. Um, yeah, I think we were talking about what topics to do, but um, and they were in Fukuoka. Um, but then I saw there were some other fantastic presentations on this. People probably got um, tone tired. Um, <laughs> I, I think there's there's so many angles. There are so many angles you can sort of go go up with these types of topics, and I think that it's definitely not an exhaustive topic. But I mean, it's been fascinating talking to you and. Uh, today, thanks for, for making the time to talk to me and to go through all of this stuff uh, and to indulge my sort of curiosity and admiration for what you've been doing um, online. I've really, really enjoyed it, and I've I've got a lot from it over the uh, the time indoors, so to speak. Are there any places that people should go to find you? And you know, if it, I, unlikely that they're going to find me after finding you know find you after finding me because. I think that it's probably going to be the other way around. People have, have heard of you first, but even so, no. <laughs> there, are, there are the odd people out there that haven't heard of you. Richard, no. Richard's the god. <laughs> um, well, so, so my 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 name's Stuart J. Raj. So everybody knows me um, as Stu J. I guess in in Southeast Asia, everyone calls me J. Um, so Stu J. S T U J Y. So if you go to StuJ.com. You'll see my blog there with all of these art and all of these infographics and, and other stuff in learning. It's a it's been going since 2007. Um, Sujay also for or just Google my uh, in YouTube. So YouTube channels been around for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, and then J Academy. So J is basically Academy. Instead of the first A, spell it with a J. Um, jacademy.com and um, all of my resources there's a ton of free stuff there that you just get open an account and you'll get all the free stuff there um, but yeah and then, then there's groups on Facebook <laughs> so if you're in the Thai group and everything um, there's some really cool discussions that that happen there but come through any of those I'm very easily contactable if that's the <laughs> word <laughs> um, yeah, I'm, I was just looking yeah contact me i was doing this <laughs> my daughter was sitting here we were doing the sound check before so cookie contact jacademy.com there we go today.com <laughs> oh boy oh boy oh boy i've been watching too much sesame street with good my at that. daughter <laughs> you're good at it hey bert <laughs> we'll have to get you on for a different topic about um yeah entertaining kids and we'll just do an entire hour of it <laughs> play it to the children <laughs> we have sesame street wall to wall in our household lately <laughs> i love it i love it and the other thing i suppose people will be interested in knowing more news as as it develops on on how this works moving forward with the school uh international yeah. school and if you're ever going to open a school and if even adults can sign up to be sort of under your tutelage. <laughs> I was putting it together because the program, the first two modules, um, the, or the first lesson, because I really want to get people um, in there. Um, we're going to be doing um, escaping your body. So basically okay. getting, we've got some stuff where we're getting out of our mother tongues and stuff like that's going to be fun. Um, and the other one is shadow speakers. So we'll actually be doing L1 to L1 shadowing. Mm -hmm. um, so getting people to speak and getting these kids to tell the same story shadowing so they can start to get into that mode that we get into when we're doing simultaneous interpreting. Um, but I want, but I've, I've seen people light up when they do these two exercises, but adults have said, heck, I know, you know, change, change the name. I want to be in there as well. So we're actually thinking of letting adults into the older kids ones. You know, if they want to come and be part of it, I think it's um, applicable to everyone. I think there'll definitely be appetite for that. I can absolutely imagine that. So uh, yeah, good luck with it. Good luck with that. Anyway, and I, I look forward to seeing how you get on with the school and, and how all that turns out. And um, thank you again for- uh, No, thank um, you so much, Richard. I, um, I love everything that you do. And every time that we talk, 
you could go on forever. Well, exactly. um, never bored. <laughs> no, it's like always I, a lot of fun, and we'll have to talk. I think about I, I think I mentioned my wife has forbidden me, and we, truly so. At you know normal parties, I'm not allowed to talk about language and stuff like that. <laughs> You see people, uh, but um, it's when speaking with you and all the people in your community that um, yeah, I get to come alive in the language side of me. It's fantastic. Well, I mean, I, I'm the same. Um, I kind of don't get to talk about that in my in my normal time either. My wife would probably kill me if I if I had to do it because I'm already language mad as it is. Um, but yeah, like you, it's sort of the the sort of ways to let out and to sort of just let out that that passion languages is just with other like-minded people who who are, who love languages or are interested in languages and um i could talk forever about etymologies yeah. and all sorts of things so again thank you and we've got about five hours no. <laughs> anytime this i mean this this video could go on for another five hours and i think we'd be uh, probably have other people who would who would love it and other people like in saying that our next video I'm, I'm learning russian now and getting into slavic and these and i know you're the master and I'm loving the links between Sanskrit because I mm. know Sanskrit and it's amazing. So maybe we can do that for a future. That one. would be really interesting, actually, because I, I saw the list of words and I read through the list of words that you put together. Yeah. Um, um, that would be an entirely different video, I'm sure, but it would be an absolutely fantastic video to make and, and to, just to talk about it with you because, um, you know, have it, my, as you know, my main focuses have been um, Germanic, Romance, and Slavic languages uh, through my studies. And speaking of Sl a Slavic language as a home language, it's it's very strange how the other Slavic languages are not really foreign languages anymore. Mm. Very strange feeling of it never feels foreign again. It's very odd. I, I guess you have that with Thai. And but, but you know what? As I've been reading through and learning Russian and then getting into all, because I've actually then learned um, into Slavic, I've been learning. Uh -huh. the Mezhislavyensky and then getting to Polish and Czech but I'm actually feeling a similar similar affinity from the Sanskrit yeah. um even though I'm, I'm, I'm nowhere near fluent or anything but I'm seeing oh heck this is actually familiar <laughs> and they're not that different yeah Super and anyway that's a, that's for another clip that's definitely for another clip yeah I I, I absolutely agree <laughs> otherwise I think we'd talk about everything forever and ever and your wife would probably <laughs> Um, be ready to murder you on the other side of this call. <laughs> I think you'll see a saucepan coming out over the uh, <laughs> very shortly. Yes, well, enjoy the rest of your evening and thank you so much again for your time and do thank your wife for loaning uh, you to me to talk. I appreciate that and um, again, thanks for all of your words and sharing all this great stuff. Thank you, Richard. Thank you.